Thank you, Erica. Thank uh, all the organizers for this invitation. And uh, I promise the important we had to make to make this conference happen. It was tremendous. So uh, today I will speak about uh, a topic that I wanted to speak about, but definitely uh, no, I changed the title because I don't remember what it was and uh, those many years ago. <laughs> the topic is the same, but the title is very widely different. But uh, it remains what I really wanted to speak about. So this is not only my work. Uh, I collaborated in this respect with my colleague Hugo Mirvanios from Bielefeld, uh, who is a numerical analyst. So it is a, we, we formed a team, but the team was sort of different because he knows something, I know something, but there's very little uh, in the intersection. So <clears throat> I don't want to say that we work independently, but uh, uh, this is a theoretical, paper, a theoretical work, but also numerical work. And uh, I can tell you that I uh, read like one paper on numerical analysis, so you can imagine how expert I am in that part of the, of the research. Uh, so this is how it happened. Uh, about this slide, I, you see that it's 24, but I will give you 11, not 11, 18. <laughs> I prepared something, but I decided not to, not to be too much into detail, so I will try to present it uh, only on the, on the surface. Uh, to go too deep into, uh, into what uh, or how we did it, because I don't think this is the right space for that. So that is uh, it. I, I prepared the, the, the talk yesterday, so it's shifted. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to do it. It did it, it itself. So uh, I have two pictures. Well, okay, one one picture at the beginning of the talk. The other picture is at the end of the talk, so this is in order to keep your attention all the time, <laughs> so that there is some bonus at the end. In between, there will be some mathematics. So this is the motivation. I hope you can see the picture uh, correctly. So uh, um, the motivation for, for this is, it can come from the, from the area of, uh, of science that comprises <laughs> mathematics, uh, engineering, and information, uh, IT, IT specialists, uh, and so the model is really uh, made to be applicable. So we don't want to make too much science because uh, that will go entirely nowhere. So our intention is to make the research and uh, also to make it applicable. So the methods should be uh, somehow possible to be translated to a computer in order the computer can generate the results. So we are motivated completely practically here. So, what you get uh, in reality is only the middle picture. Okay, so this, 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 is a, this is an example uh, that we took from Wikipedia, and uh, this is the image restoration problem. So what you get, uh, I know how to make the font work. So this is this is what the image is. So there is an image. So it's not only images. So this is not limited to our deep, our two problems. This is a general that we have a <coughs> domain O. Here, this is this is the domain. In this case, this is a rectangle. There is a function g on this domain, which is a real value. So you can imagine the domain is consisted of pixels. And to each pixel, we assign uh, a number from a real, uh, real line a scale, from uh, ranging from white to, uh, to black or some other scale. But what I really want to emphasize that uh, this is an example. In general, we have a multidimensional domain, which you can see here that, uh, that doesn't have smooth boundary. So that, that's even if it comes, for example, from tomography. So is, you can imagine the human body that is being scanned. You can imagine that uh, so the body is the domain O, and the boundary of the, of the, of the body is highly irregular. So that, that is one point that we really take if we start to study a problem. We say, let's take a domain with a smooth boundary. So that's immediately closing the door to applications. And uh, so this should be the result. 
Okay, so there is some uh, some noise. Uh, I, I mean, some some uh, some data. We don't see this, but you can see that there are some grains uh, on the background. <coughs> so this is the noise. So so we get uh, uh, a function which is somehow noised or blurred. And what we want to get is uh, somehow make it this And we don't we're not we, we can't hope to get this one because we don't have the, the full data that we are just motiva motivated to make the input somehow better. So <laughs> there are two requirements for this. Uh, the first one is somehow average. So, so average the picture. So you see so this is the background, this should be the sky, that should be somehow uniform, but we have too many grains that should be so removed. Uh, so this could be done with, with some smooth things or some average. But on the other hand, that's, that's not the only requirement because you can also see the contour of the cameraman here. And we don't want to smooth the contours. We want to preserve the discontinuity of the, of the, of the function, of the input. So there are two somehow uh, contradictory requirements that we need to balance. And, uh, this is how, how to do it. So, uh, the way that the people from, from image processing do it, that they, they construct a functional, which they want to minimize. So the minimization is that somehow making the, the result uh, as best as possible. Of course, the problem is how to choose this J. This is the functional that should do the work for us. And, uh, <laughs> The first example of this functional that should be minimized is this one. So you can see this integral is the, is the diffusion. So this one does the, the averaging or the smoothing uh, of the picture or the function that we are given. But on the other hand, there is also this term that is saying don't average too much and keep or force for the solution to be still close to the uh, to the original input. Input that we don't get too far. So. In general, this will work if the image is not blurred too much. Okay, so there must be some good information in the input. And what we want to do is some to, to make uh, to get rid of the of the of the, of the noise that the noise must be somewhat small. And uh, this has a problem because as you see, we're minimizing over H1. So that means that uh, this this uh, procedure well not likely to be uh, to, to, to provide us with this continuous solution. So we, as, you, as you notice, that we also want, wanted the, the contours to be remain, to be preserved. But it doesn't work, okay? Because uh, as I said, the, the contours uh, are somehow being averaged, which is not what we want. But then uh, uh, a better model with different, actually only in, the, in this point here, that we have squared, now we have one. L1 norm of the gradient, and uh, this, 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 gives, this gives the only good results. So, in practice, this does what we want, but the problem is that it's difficult, much more difficult than the previous one to approach. Because, for instance, here you see that uh, we are losing reflexibility or reflexibility of the, of the space. So, if you want to find the minimum of functional, that we just try to approach it, but the sequence. Uh, will not converge anywhere, not even, to, not even if we pass to a subsequence because of the lack of reflexivity. So that's where the mathematical, the main mathematical complication comes from. So in order to be able to find the minimum of the functional, we need to, uh, to enlarge the space. So uh, BV stands for, for the space of bounding variation functions, which maybe some of you know. Of course, everybody knows about function of bounding variation on an interval. But this here, our domain is multidimensional, so we extend the definition and uh, it really coincides with the known, the classical notion of bounding variation function or real interval. So the, the only difference is that uh, the function, radian function, so this is in general only a distribution. And that distribution must be represented, representable. To uh, a, a, me a measure. Okay, so each partial derivative is, is uh, assigned measure. So in total, the gradient, this is a vector. So this, this is the definition that the gradient is represented by a vector measure, Rd value per unit one. Okay, if we put uh, this norm on this uh, space or these terms into a space, 
bad one, or perplexive, or not going to be temperable, but we have the compactness method there. So if we have a sequence which can be distributed bounded, so we can draw a true sequence that converges to something and that would be possibly uh, the, 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 the result, the denoised image. Okay, and how to, how to do it? So the problem, there is no time in that whole work. And uh, as I said, we want to be practical. <coughs> so uh, the idea that is not from us, but we took it uh, from papers that are inside the references later, is to apply the steepest distance method. So how to explain this method uh, simply. So imagine that our functional is defined on an infinite dimensional space. But let's simplify it to an Euclidean space. So J is a convex function, it's non-negative, it's strictly convex, so there will be only one. Uh, minimum that will be global minimum. How, how to get there? So just imagine for the for the moment that J is differentiable. And we will uh, we will start somewhere at any point, and we call this differential equation. And uh, at any point, uh, we know that uh, the convex function there is a uh, the set of uh, directions from a certain point. So the gradient indicates in, in which direction does the yeah. the function grows as most at most. So we tell we tell you the solution at any point. Look at the, the converse direction and go to the valley all the time anywhere you are. And we let this equation run. Okay, so uh, we have a solution. So you can do uh, the, just differentiate the composition of the function with the solution. So this is what you get. And then apply uh, the equality of it on the middle line. And you see that uh, uh, the composition itself will be decreasing. So it will go to the valley. It will just take a maybe long run, but it will definitely decrease all the time. As long as we're not in the minimum. Any time. So <coughs> the only point where this is zero is the minimum. So if we are away from it, we will strictly decrease. And this is a method that will lead us in time, uh, maybe in an infinite time, but then, uh, we don't hope for that, okay? But it will definitely lead us to, to the minimum. And this way is constructible. So this is applicable, you can put it in a computer, and the computer will tell you. Uh, how to get to the minimum. <laughs> okay, so that was a, uh, the motivation for, for that. And this is what we apply even in infinite dimensions. So let's look at what this, uh, what, what this does give us for, for, for the first one, which we know is not a good one, but just for, for curious and curiosity, let us look to what model this will lead to. And uh, if we apply the, the OE, which is now PDE, so we just get a linear heat equation that, that would be great. There's nearly everything known about it as far as this problem would be concerned, but we know that this is not working and this is not what we want. So let's look at the, the group norm. So this is the equation with L1 norm instead of L2 norm. And this leads to this equation. Okay, so you clearly see that this is not what we're going to solve. This is similar to the generic paper from SPD or PD, also writes an equation on page one, highlights it, and then you go to the paper at page 10 to see what the author really does, what, what the solution is, and the definition takes one page. So this is exactly it. So this uh, would work if, of course, the gradient <coughs> would somehow remain away from zero, which is hardly a uh, uh, there will be too much constraint to assume in that model. So this is somehow only a formal equation, and we want to give, we'll need to make it meaningful in, in a second, so in a few cases. And now, uh, so that was for deterministic motivation. Now, well, this is SPD, as we noticed, all of us are something from that. So uh, we need some W somewhere. And this is where it comes in. So what uh, we do now, uh, so this is the, the drift or the equation that we had on the slide before. So this is the deterministic problem. And we know that this term is doing the averaging. This term is guaranteeing the solution to remain close to the noise image or the input data. And our motivation is to, to make it even better by adding this term here. And I will explain you how would we were thinking to do it. So, uh, we, come, we would like to have B of this form, and this is what we think that we should do. So if 
x is a pixel, we remain on the rectangular domain. But if it's a pixel, <coughs> the value on the scale is the color. So if x as a solution is close to, 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 to g, so we, we would like to have b small, it's about around zero, and we suppress the, the noise, which is also depending on, on, on the pixel here. So the idea is to make b small at zero, and some positive or even growing uh, if we are away. So one would believe that the noise could help to push, uh, push the solution back, back somewhere uh, to, to the image, and it's to a way to help the uh, the diffusion term to leverage the solution. So this is the motivation that uh, we have we have in mind. So in, uh, implicitly, this implies that finite dimensional noise will, will not be enough for us. So we also need the dependence of the noise on the particular pixel in the domain. And now I think, yeah, this is a good time to, to say what, what the solution uh, should be, how the solution should be defined. So this is the equation which I copied from a, from a previous slide. And uh, if you remember, this is uh, the, the steepest point method. So we, we got this drift as a minus de derivative of the functional that we wanted to minimize. So this is an abstract form of the equation, and this is the number of kinetic drift. And I just copied also the, the functional over here. So at this point, <laughs> it's time to reveal the card completely. So this functional, uh, will not work on, on the space of bounded variation function because the gradient will not be an L1 function anymore it will be a measure so we have to replace this by the, the total variation which is the same thing if, if the gradient is density it doesn't so we, we have to make sense, make, make sense to that and we replace it by the total variation this is a vector value sigma additive measure on the domain so we know what the total variation of such a measure is yeah. It would be the total variation of u, because you wrote total variation of gradient u. This is the, the norm of the total variation of the gradient. So the gradient is a measure, and we take the total variation of this vector value measure. Because u is a total, is a bound, only bounded variation function, so the gradient is not a function, need not be a function. Is not linearly only. And uh, another thing, the, the term, also we brought the problem with Dirichlet boundary conditions in order to make, make it, give it a chance to, to have a solution. But in general, it, it seems that uh, that's not, uh, that's not possible, at least at this moment, to, to attain. So we need to drop the assumption to keep the solution of zero on the boundary. Despite the boundary regular enough to have values in there, but instead, we have to take the norm of the u on the boundary of the domain. So even bounded variation functions have traces. And so this is this is actually the functional that we need to work from from now on. And uh, how the solution will be constructed? So uh, we will take. So we are used to test functions, but now we will use test processes. So phi, that will be our test processes. This is a, a semi-martingale in L2. So G, this is an L2 value of the solid measure of the interval of the process. The same for A, this is also an L2 interval. And we assume that phi is uh, falling in, so there will be some additional assumption that phi remains in the domain of the function of G. And we do, what we do, we just apply the eta formula. So this is, well, we can approach it either that this is a formal into our people formula applied to the problem, but if, if we had a solution, that would make sense. So if this was really a, a full drift, so if all that would converge, so this is what we would get. Anyway, so this is how uh, we will proceed. So this is beta formula, and this is the, the only thing that we want to get rid of because everything else works fine. So we, uh, we consider this property, J is a convex function, and every convex function satisfies this property. So with the bad term, instead of that, we will make an estimation from above. And that will be how we'll make the, the solution, the definition of the solution. 
So instead of a differential equation, we will have a differential inequality that might look bizarre at this moment, but it is very useful because this tells us if uh, phi, this process phi, is such that so phi zero is close to the initial the initial datum, and if this integral j over phi is close to this one, and if uh, h is close to bx, so these three terms will even the fourth one will be nearly zero, close to zero, and this will be suitable to apply the wrong one. So, we said, so this is how uh, this is very useful how to get close to the solution. This this is this is intuitively tell, telling us how to provide the approximations. This is also very useful to put the neatness of the solution because we will approximate the solution via some phi and that will eventually show that there is only unique solution. You know, the, the last thing is to prove existence. And well, the existence will, will, uh, will also follow by the, the construction. So because we, used, we applied only the Peter formula. So despite this doesn't look uh, very friendly, this is very useful and already standard over the past years, the standard definition of the solution. So this is called SVI, like stochastic variation of inequality solution. And the solution intended to take values in L2 intersection bounded variation. So this kind of problem requires great, it contains gradients. So this is a big space. Uh, but we need it in order that our solutions are discontinuous. Because I think that we want to preserve the contour. So we don't want our solutions to be too regular. If we have regularity, so we're doing something wrong. So now I'm good with time. Some uh, some uh, some literature. So the, the first paper, so I ordered the papers in the chronological order. The first paper is a deterministic, there is uh, no W. And this is where, well, those authors did uh, a numerical analysis of the problem, and they used, this is what we're from where we see the, the CSDGC method. And uh, they also reply, they also proved uh, many, many properties of the deterministic problem. Uh, the, the three, the remaining three papers are all stochastic. So I think the first paper was a large Reckner, 2009, where they have the lower dimension, sophisticated noise, and the sophisticated noise. They proved plenty of things. They made a good, good description of the problem from the stochastic point of view. And then in the subsequent paper, <coughs> in 2013, they extended <laughs> their, their results to, to all dimensions, still with, with this sort of noise. So this is still in a noise. Uh, basically, they required still some, some smoothness of the, on the boundary. And uh, as you can see in those two papers, uh, one of the results, a qualitative result, was that the, the solution extends into, into finite time. So this is certainly something that people from image processing don't want to hear. Oh, of course. So this is good mathematics, right? But it's not applicable. It can't be applied in image processing. Because, of course, this is not what, what people want to see, blank image after finite time. So we have to digress from these uh, methods. And uh, I think this was due to the, the model itself. So it, was, it was not really coming from, from, uh, from the functional that I introduced at the beginning. Even if uh, in this paper, in 2018, the noise seems already to be somewhat better. So if you imagine that x is somewhere at some position constant, so the gradient will become zero. And uh, in this region, the noise will not be applied. So this is a good idea. But on the other hand, if there is some discontinuity, so well, then the gradient will be something like infinity. So that means there, the noise is becoming very super active. Near, near the discontinuity. This is, of course, something that uh, we don't believe uh, is what, what, uh, what the models should do. Uh, so then there is one paper, at least as far as I know, that is uh, concerned with, with numerical approximations. So 
And this is where we're starting from. So well, as, and until now, I didn't speak anything about anything that we already did. I hope to get to that in the, in the last minute. But, uh, so this is the big one we started from, and we were motivated to get rid of this, uh, get rid of this uh, regularities, uh, regularities uh, of the boundary. Because, as I said, the domains that come from our uh, applications have irregular boundaries, so that, that's our motivation. So we didn't want this. Uh, I think this piecewise C2 smooth boundary comes from, from an earlier paper by Michael Reckner and Nadir Barbu, where uh, an honest partial lemma was provided, and this is a very useful term. But I think, in fact, that, uh, they say that there's C2 regularity required. I think that there might be something else. Some further analysis to make the method work. But anyway, the, uh, the idea is to get rid of it completely and just work with convex domains. So the, the second motivation is to replace this, this noise by the noise that I contributed, while reflecting how far we are from the, from the original image. And uh, of course, they, they started to work uh, numerically. So they had to put some regularization into the band term. So in this, in this respect, this equation basically will be proved is well posted page one. So that you can find solutions in the standard way, uh, in the standard positive descent in page one. And then they extended the results to L2. So H1 is not a good space, so they extended the results to L2 spaces where this continuous point is far. So they had a method, they, have, they, they discretized this idea of <laughs> design and also in space, like this conforming finite element method. And the solution that they got uh, has three in this case. Epsilon comes from the regularization of the trip. So is the time step. The discretization and h is the size of the of the triangulation, and uh, they could prove that the method is okay. So they got strong convergence in L two. But the problem is that they, they had to keep this epsilon phrased, and they showed the convergence of the method, but not to the original problem. Okay, so this is how the numerical analysis works. You just discretize, discretize very smooth, smooth, smooth. So you sort of hope to get to the solution, but you're not approaching the solution itself, but you're approaching only the approximation of the solution. So, but what they made it better, okay? So, when they have this, uh, this, the limit here, so you have to prove that this epsilon goes to zero, so they get to the SVI solution of the original problem, okay? But this is coming a step back towards theory, step out from the medical analysis. So, I think now. And that will be the only slide about our results. So there will be no details. I will just present what we did. So we started with the same model, but we removed any assumptions on the regularity of the boundary. So the only assumption that we have that the domain is boundary of convex, the side of this moment can be also zero, not only positive tree. So we started the approximation is epsilon positive, strictly positive, and uh, I will, I will show it on the, on the last, last picture, uh, on the last slide, how we did the, the, the approximation. So the B was not only uh, linear multiplicative, but basically nearly anything. So we only needed to assume that B were linearly in L2, and uh, either it should be Lipschitz continuous, or to have this sort of strength, strength and continuity. In general, B need not even be are very good, it may be just a continuous diffusion. So I think this is quite uh, a general result. Of course, we don't get uniqueness in general, right? If B is too abstract. So yeah. on, on the theoretical level, you see global existence of the original problem. So that means with epsilon equal to zero, uniqueness has yeah. some terms. If B behaves well, so we have no uniqueness, but always, which is of course clear because we don't. Uh, we we, we like, relax the assumptions on the, on the diffusion term very much. And uh, so that was for the theory. And now, this is where Lubomir entered. So then what we did was to take the conforming finite element. I think I should write something on the blackboard. So, what, but, uh, so let, let us imagine that we are in plane, in plane domain. So this method says that we take some regular triangles that we 
which means they need not be completely regular, but they cannot, the errors might not be too, too sharp at the end. And, and, uh, yes. No, this is not, this is forbidden. Okay. Maybe like this. So the space B8, so this is the space of finite elements in this conforming element method, is tells us that on each of these triangles, which are tetrahedrons in RD or pyramids in, in higher dimensions or simplices, so these functions must be linear or affine on each of the triangles. And if we put them together, we must obtain a continuous function. So that means that the function of each uh, neighboring triangles must have the same values on the edges. And also in the vertices. So this is uh, how a uh, conforming forming finite element method works. And then this is how it is solved. So this is an inductive method. So imagine that you constructed x times with i minus 1. So you look for the solution of a finite dimensional problem, which you solve omega bonds. Okay, so if it's omega, you solve it, and this is what the computer can do. And also with the noise, there is no noise, so you can just imagine that we start with some bunch of independent random variables that are centered, that have the proper covariance, and some, or maybe some, some estimations from the fourth moment in order to make it converge. But it can really be minus one to one. So that's why you write about a sequence, so I can be very away in probability. So this is something the computer can do. It can give us a really something that we can graph, that uh, people can program. Computer. And then we will make from series. Well, I helped him, okay, so I hope to have some credits in there. <laughs> but not too much. Uh, the non confirmed forming element method. So this is, uh, uh, this is uh, still the same triangulation in, uh, in plane. So the difference is okay, so the functions in this space V8, this is not, not in H1 anymore. So this is the regular U of C. So still this must be affine or linear on each of the triangle. But the continuity needs to be satisfied only in by centers of the pyramid. So in, in the case of triangles, so this is the middle point. So the function itself will not be continuous anymore. It will just coincide here. And, the, and I forgot to say it in the boundary. So if there is no neighboring triangle, then there might be zero. Okay. In, the, in, the, in conforming method, we have to have zeros on the outer edges. So here we will have zeros in the centers or in the bicenters. So you can imagine that those are somehow shifted hyperplanes for each of the triangles, which in totality is a discontinuous function except for this, uh, in these points in the, in the bar centers. If we had tetrahedrons, so that would be the centers of the edges. So the continuity is preserved only in the neighboring um, pyramid uh, centers. But or well, I think it's still called triangulation, even if it's a triangulation, I'm not sure. And otherwise, the same uh, model is applied, except for this, because as you can see, so in the conforming method, the function from the space V of H was still H1, and we could speak about uh, a nabla or a gradient. At this point, we apply the nabla only in each of the triangles separately, and we sum up. So this is what this discrete uh, gradient is. Now, this is somehow curious. So, okay, so we we have this. Uh, in time, we have the process defined only in, in those time discrete discrete times, and now we have to make this to turn this into a real process defined for all times. And there are three ways how to do it. Oh, there are more of them, but there are three simple ways how to do it. So the first one. Is to take the piecewise value, say this is a plane with French words word interchanging right and left. Okay, so people usually work with Cadillac, but this we, we start with Cadillac. So that means that there is a continuity from left, a limit from right. Whereas the third one is different. So this is just continuity from right, limit from left, and the middle one 
it's got a piecewise linear interpolation. So what I this, this is the picture of those points are those functions at these discrete times. And this is the first one, so that I didn't draw the other pictures, but you can see this is the uh, continuity from left. This is how the interpolum, and you just have to remember that this one is the overline, the, the piecewise linear is without any line, and the, the continuity from right will be denoted by the underline and the hex. And the noise that comes from those uh, very new sequences will be approximated. Uh, in, in the standard way that we uh, You see that there are three possible interpolation interpolants. You, can you guess? Well, you can do it, you don't have to tell me that. So it will be like somehow you know, right here. One of them works, and two don't. So you can now take you know, one or two seconds and think of it, personal guess, which one will be viable, which one. You have it? Okay. The first one. That was a surprise for me because maybe people who are more experienced in numerical analysis know this. They will not be surprised that only the interpolation with continuity in left works. So you can see that we proceed by a tightness, a tensile compactness method. And uh, only the first one we were able to prove that. Uh, the gradient remains in the BV in the bounded variation spaces, not the other ones. So this was a surprising for me, because people from probability usually with the D with a score of case. We also wanted to do it, but we didn't get the prop estimate. So we have to switch somehow in time to convince ourselves that sometimes it's good also to work with other well, there's not really a big difference between that, but it's just a matter of convention. This is a, this is an example where this is also necessary to do. So we are a little somewhat on these spaces. So you know what this space is, right? The square root space. Uh, we have to replace the L2 topology with a strong one with the weak topology. And overall, to put on this space the, the topology of uniform convergence. Uh, so this is what we all, all these three spaces. This is the only difference that we have the, the, the continuity from left and the village from right. <coughs> so, as you know, uh, if you consider this topology of the Scorachot space, it will not be separable anymore. That's why Scorachot invented his famous metric, but we don't use it. We are happy with the convergence of with the topology of uniform convergence. And it doesn't bother us because we were still able to prove compactness in this day. Respect to tightness. So we remained in separable subspaces. So, of course, if you replace that, uh, if you work with V topology, this is not a poly space anymore, but it's still a locally convex space. Well, nearly all methods of Bochelor theorem work, and even I feel like that. So we got the tightness of these interpolants. Speed up. So, yeah, this is how we proceeded. So, this is basically the proof. That we constructed our omega was the canonical space for all these uh, processes that we had worked with. So X was the first process, the canonical <laughs> process for the first component, Y, Z, and W for the noise. The tightness provi provided us with uh, this understood uh, terms of convergent subsequence. We have kind of the Prokhorov theorem. With, and now the, uh, this is important that we were able to really go with all the parameters to zero at one time. So this turned the, the model into something which was viable, which was applicable in practice. Then, we, on the way that I didn't show some energy estimates and other estimates, so at the end, all the approximates coincide, so it, uh, it really didn't matter which, with which one we started, but we had to start with the Kaglat, Approximation in order we had uh, really the solution and that we had the BV property preserved. And uh, in the end, uh, we just proved that this is a, a Martingale solution. Uh, I didn't write that we used Korokov theorem because we didn't use it. Uh, this is somehow a topic that I also wanted to advertise. Uh, those people who construct martingale solutions 
all over and over and over. So I think usually people learn how to do it from the book by the Pratlan Zabchi. So there was like you prove tightness, then you apply Skorokhorov theorem, Skorokhorov theorem, and uh, the theorem for representation of Martingers to provide at the end the, the W. Uh, Sometimes people realize that the last step was not necessary, that the Skorokhorov theorem and the Pratlan theorem could do the work. But then even people, I think it started with Martina Hofmanova and Jan Seidler years ago, you realize that not even the score of the theorem is necessary because everything is given for you by the Proclo theorem. It doesn't simplify anything if you if you if you grasp it uh, correctly, and it's even easier actually. So the thing that replaces the score of theorem is the Portmanteau theorem, which is basically a theorem which uh, tells you what convergence of probability measure is equivalent with. So something with lim inf with open sets, lim sub with closed sets. Everybody had it in the course of probability. Uh, I, this is what I wanted to end with, but I decided and probably because my time is over. So I will not explain this uh, part of the talk at all. And as I promised, I have one picture. So this is what Google is. So what you see on, on the top, so on the top picture, it's not the original image. So this is the image where the noise is already present. But you see that there is not too much noise, they don't want it. So <coughs> the, uh, the noise need not, cannot be too strong. So the, you can clearly guess what the, what the true image was. And here is what he, uh, what he got when he applied the conforming method. So this is what he approximated it by H1 functions. This is what he, what he got when uh, he applied the conforming method. So I leave it on you, but you can guess which, which model, which method is better. So I, I, I think uh, I'm going to stop here. I need to stop. <laughs> okay. Thank so, you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr.